thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to speak to you today. This is a very distinguished uh, venue, and uh, I'm delighted uh, that uh, in Ireland today uh, we can discuss these uh, banking uh, issues in, in slightly uh, calmer uh, circumstances than, than when uh, I took over my, my, my new job uh, back in 2010. Um, I should add that uh, when we were driving down uh, to this uh, uh, venue, I was informed by colleagues that this was a rough area, so I thought that it was very appropriate, uh, given that we were going to talk about banking and state aid control and burden sharing. Uh, but I must say, looking uh, straight ahead of me, uh, I, I don't quite have the impression that it is a rough area. At least the building is very uh, impressive. Now, what, what I think I'll do uh, today is quickly run you through um, um, three issues. First, to talk a little bit about state aid control uh, during the crisis then to zoom in on uh, some of the main developments. Don't worry, I will not bore you with all the uh, technical changes that have taken place. But finally, and I think that's probably the most interesting thing at this juncture, to zoom in on uh, the role of state aid control in the transition uh, to the banking union, which is really the big debate uh, we are confronted with today. So I'll, I'll start with uh, the role of state aid control. I, I take it my slides will be available for you uh, uh, probably be uploaded, so I'll, I'll skip one or two slides which are more for background, but go straight to uh, how state aid control was used uh, as of the autumn of 2008 when the financial crisis uh, in Europe led to unprecedented uh, bailouts of banks, um, and when we realized that, uh, in essence, uh, there were no central crisis management tools available and that the internal market uh, came under enormous pressure. Here in Ireland, of course, you are uh, familiar with what happened when uh, the Irish banks came under pressure, when the Irish uh, Department of Finance decided to um, um, uh, in introduce uh, uh, a blanket guarantee on bank liabilities, which led to movements from the UK, just as an illustration of how purely national uh, rescue measures during the crisis had an impact on the internal market. And, at that juncture, the Commission decided that it had to uh, step in in order to ensure that uh, these uh, financial stability measures uh, would not go at the expense of financial stability in other member states or the internal market for that matter. So uh, back in 2008 and 2009, the Commission, acting under its exclusive competence to which our Chairman has referred uh, for state aid control under the treaty, built up uh, a rule book. Uh, which in essence uh, set out the conditions under which member states could aid banks, be it uh, through capital injections or liquidity support or, or, or other measures such as impaired asset measures. Now, these rules uh, can, I think, uh, briefly be summarized uh, by uh, referring to the three pillars that uh, guide uh, our interventions, which are viability, uh, burden sharing, and the need to remedy distortions of competition, which are inherent in any bank uh, uh, rescue uh, operation, of course. So the rules, in essence, uh, set out how restructuring operations could be conducted, pricing guidelines for guarantees, uh, but also for recaps, rules governing impaired asset measures, um, and more generally, uh, remuneration requirements. Now, those tools were used to ensure that we actually, in dealing with uh, restructuring and resolution cases, could uh, reach the three objectives I've mentioned. And I think it's important to point out as a practitioner that, somewhat to our surprise, the bulk of our work has actually consisted to ensure that banks receiving state aid you know, could reasonably demonstrate to be able to return to viability at the end of a restructuring period. The, the thing that has surprised me most uh, in, in all of this is that uh, there was a high degree of denial in many uh, uh, bank boards. Uh, also, some national supervisors uh, felt that uh, um, the deep restructuring which we sometimes have had to impose was not uh, immediately uh, necessary. Um, but I think the r rigorous uh, application of external uh, uh, verification uh, and uh, assessments uh, for which the Commission has also relied on uh, external consultants who 
uh, you know, are, have, have a lot of experience in this field, has, I think, proven to be, to be valuable because, to date, there have been very few of the restructured banks under, under state aid rules that, you know, uh, went uh, off track and uh, had to come back uh, for, for more support or, or eventually had to be resolved. So these restructuring plans are, are typically very tough. They lead to de-risking um, uh, to ensure that uh, the underlying causes of uh, the difficulties in which these banks uh, got into were, were addressed. They invariably involve a lot of cost cutting. Uh, many of these banks were overstaffed and overpaid. Um, and I would say they also often uh, involved a, a streamlining of the business model of the banks concerned to ensure that management could really focus on uh, activities with which they had experience and where the bank could be expected to have a comparative uh, advantage. The objective, of course, was to ensure that uh, after the restructuring period, the bank returned to viability, uh, could earn uh, uh, normal profits, and would not need any public support. That's the first pillar, and as I said, in practice, most of the work we've done on individual institutions has focused on this, uh, on this aspect. Second pillar, burden sharing, very important. In essence, uh, what we try to ensure through these rules is that the costs for the taxpayer, uh, the state, are, are reduced, uh, minimized, and secondly, that moral hazard is addressed because obviously we all know that banks that count on uh, being bailed out have an implicit subsidy. Um, the subsidy has been quantified as running into several hundreds of billions uh, for the entire EU banking system, and this leads to uh, unnecessary risk-taking, undue risk-taking, I should say, which uh, we felt had to be addressed by requiring owners of banks, and in some cases creditors of banks, to contribute to the uh, rescue of the bank. Third element, remedying competition distortions. In essence, what we try to do here is to limit the impact on the markets of saving banks that would have otherwise failed in a normal market when a firm is not viable, gets into trouble, it exits, uh, and then uh, the competitors who have been more cautious or who have been uh, better at uh, conducting their business uh, take over their market share. This is a normally functioning econ econ economic uh, 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 system, but, but obviously uh, with uh, the financial stability concerns we were, we were addressing, this, this could not be followed. So we were trying, we have, we have tried through these competition measures to redress these distortions as much as possible, and typically this is required uh, divesting uh, viable uh, subsidiaries or forcing bank banks to exit parts of markets where uh, they uh, 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 were, were, were active and, and where they were earning uh, uh, a healthy profit. Now you can, you can clearly see from this description that there can be a bit of a tension between the viability, the return to profit uh, uh, objective and, and the competition measures that we uh, have had to impose. And this is been uh, a challenge in, in designing individual restructuring decisions where we've had to marry these two, uh, these two objectives. Um, in terms of how this was actually dealt with practically, as I said, we, we, we wrote a, a rule book, all of which is available on our, on our website. And one feature of these rules when they were brought in in 2008 was that they were very flexible. So they allowed a rescue phase because we were dealing with a financial crisis that, in essence, required immediate action, followed by a uh, discussion on a restructuring plan. Um, there were many procedural innovations. In essence, uh, DG Comp was given uh, quite far-reaching powers. I should say the commissioner for DG Competition was given quite far-reaching powers to essentially allow us to take decisions within uh, 24 or, or 48 hours. And finally, we set up a dedicated team of about uh, 50 to 60 people uh, who uh, were dealing with all these cases. These uh, colleagues were, to a large extent, drawn from regulators in the banking industry, obviously uh, economists from within uh, uh, DG Comp and, 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 and our legal state aid experts uh, complemented uh, the team. Fairly small team, just 50 to 60 people for, for the whole of the EU, but relying, as I said, on uh, consultants uh, who worked on individual cases uh, with us uh, and whom uh, were paid for uh, by the banks uh, that got into trouble. Now, I think it's maybe worth illustrating the significance of state aid control during the crisis. Um, so far, uh, we have uh, worked on the restructuring of 67 banks, 
And contrary to what a lot of people uh, believe outside of Ireland, I should probably say, we've, we've actually had 20 through, 23 resolution cases, um, which is uh, not insignificant. We still have 27 cases that are open, and there's some on the horizon, um, and 44 schemes, in other words, uh, uh, rules that allow uh, liquidity support to be given at prede predetermined terms uh, were, were, were decided. Given that some cases involved multiple decisions, we, we've had to take about 400 decisions to date. In terms of the amount of aid, it's, it's a staggering number. 4.9 trillion euros of aid was approved over the whole crisis, equivalent to nearly 40% of the GDP of the EU. Um, but not all of it was used. Many of these initial schemes were actually not fully deployed. Member states built up uh, a, a significant buffer. Uh, but still, the total, total amount of aid used uh, was, was very significant, 1.7 trillion euros of aid, uh, some of which is now being repaid. Uh, so this is the maximum figure. It's not the extent of state aid uh, at this uh, particular point in time. What is also very interesting is this little graph at the bottom of the slide, which shows the uh, extent to which banks got into trouble by member state, and um, in effect, 25% of the entire European banking sector is now under restructuring plans authorized by, by DG Competition. Um, but in some countries, uh, this percentage uh, uh, approaches uh, 100. Uh, Ireland is one, but you know there are other countries. My own country, the Netherlands, has, has a very high percentage, 70%. Uh, in Greece, it's nearly 100%. In Portugal, we're looking at uh, 55%. Spain only has a percentage, only I should say, a percentage of, of, of nearly 15 to 20 percent, depending on how you measure this, uh, because large parts of the banking system were actually sound. Despite that, as you know, Spain uh, had to uh, request assistance through, a, through an ESM uh, banking program. So very significant uh, uh, coverage, um, and as I will explain more in a moment, this has actually led to a situation where we've had to update our rules and also take a slightly different perspective. Initially, state aid control, uh, like in many other sectors, was case by case, very specific, but obviously when you get to these type of percentages, you need to take a systems-wide approach to think about the impact of uh, your uh, interventions across the banking system for the banking markets concerned, um, to look at the macroeconomic implications, the implications for lending to the real economy. So state aid control was, was forced to um, take on a role which uh, up until now I think it has never played, uh, played before. Um, I would say that um, viability was essential. I've already illustrated that when I described the three pillars. Um, but burden sharing has also been important and as member states uh, uh, ran out of uh, public resources, got into trouble as the economic crisis transmorphed into a sovereign crisis, the uh, uh, provisions on burden sharing actually uh, became much more important, and they are still, I think, at the heart of the debate in the context of the transition to the banking union. I'll say more about that later on. Finally, the rules have been updated to, to also reflect this growing uh, role of state aid control. Our latest banking communication, which was uh, adopted in July and which entered into force on the 1st of August very clearly sets out these more horizontal uh, considerations which we uh, take into account. <laughs> Finally, as I said before, um, there's oft Europe is often criticized for not wanting to, to wind up uh, unviable banks. It's actually not true. Um, there are a number of very big banks uh, that have been uh, wound up. West LB in Germany was a very significant London, but London's bank. I don't have to say anything about Anglo-Irish. Uh, the example of Dexia is, is also rather illustrative of, of a very significant bank. The very large numbers of banks that were resolved in the US by the FDIC were typically extremely small banks. Uh, in Europe, we've actually seen resolution of, of quite, quite significant banks. So I'll now uh, zoom in a bit more on uh, the changing uh, environment uh, we have worked on and how that has been reflected in our, in our rules. As I said, our rules have been adapted to the changing circumstances, to the evolution of the crisis. Um, our pricing rules have taken account of market realities. What we've typically tried to do is to ensure that banks that, uh, uh, you know, allowed, that banks that could, 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 could borrow on the market on the back of government guarantees that the pricing reflected relative uh, uh, 
uh, market uh, uh, perceptions of risk through CDS uh, spreads, for example, to ensure that uh, this uh, uh, market distorting effect was at least to some extent uh, a counterbalance through the, the way in which we, we've, we've set the prices. But I think the most important uh, change, which I've already mentioned, is the evolution from micro to macro, if you will, from, from an individual bank to a systems-wide approach. Um, I would also say that uh, there's been a very important uh, evolution in that as we have worked on more and more banks, um, the teams involved have learned to see what type of solutions actually would work. So the decision space that was available to member states could better be defined as we uh, could draw on our experience. And therefore, um, we've uh, evolved uh, to an authority that isn't just waiting for a member state to submit a restructuring plan, but very often at the outset already uh, can advise the member states as to what can work and what will certainly uh, not work. And then um, there's been an important evolution in terms of burden sharing, uh, where uh, our initial rules essentially uh, required shareholders uh, to be diluted, uh, in some cases significantly be diluted, and the state to be uh, remunerated uh, uh, in uh, an acceptable manner, but as uh, the crisis evolved and as many of the bank restructuring uh, uh, decisions uh, happened in the context of uh, EU, uh, well I should say Euro area IMF adjustment programs, uh, what changed as well was that the Eurozone as a whole decided that in a number of cases uh, burden sharing should be deepened. Uh, this happened in Spain. Uh, and, and most recently in Cyprus, you all know about that, of course. And of course, that meant that our burden sharing rules had to be updated to ensure that they reflected the minimum. We can only require a minimum degree of burden sharing. It's not internal market harmonization that we do in DG competition. But obviously, as some member states were pushed by uh, uh, the uh, Eurogroup to go beyond our rules, then our rules also had to be updated to ensure that they uh, remained uh, meaningful, and that is an important change uh, in our uh, most recent banking communi communication. So, to sum this up in, 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 in slightly loose language, uh, you know, what started out as essentially a coordination role uh, evolved into a de facto resolution mechanism role, very partial role, because of course we don't have the right of initiative, we cannot approach a bank, which is something a resolution authority can do. We have to wait until there is a credible prospect for state aid to be injected. Now, I'm not going to take you in detail, oops, in detail through the next two slides, but I would like to give you an impression nevertheless how we've taken forward such a systems approach in, in the case of Spain, uh, which, uh, as you know, got into trouble in uh, the first half of last year. And drawing on lessons learned, for example, here in Ireland, uh, we uh, pioneered uh, a much more synchronized approach where uh, we started out with a very tough, in-depth uh, 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 asset quality review and stress test, which then led us to uh, be able to put the different banks in buckets. We, we managed to evacuate 80% um, of the Spanish banking sector, where even after a very tough stress test, uh, it, it, it appeared that these banks were sufficiently capitalized. The rest was put in different groups and for these groups, we started work on restructuring plans um, in a pre-programmed manner. This slide actually is part of the uh, MOU that was signed in July uh, with the Spanish authorities. So we, we, we planned the entire operation, uh, putting state aid control uh, at the service also of the uh, program, um, essentially arriving at three groups of banks uh, for which we planned uh, the uh, disbursement of the aid and the adoption of the uh, restructuring and or resolution decisions ex ante. And a very important procedural change that was introduced at that juncture uh, in the context of Spain uh, was that no structural capital measures could be granted, so no capital could be put into a bank until a restructuring plan was, was actually adopted. This in combination with the experience we had in terms of being able to guide member states towards you know, viable restructuring plans allowed us to take very quick decisions. Um, in total, eight banks were uh, restructured, and all of the decisions were adopted between September and December uh, uh, last year. 
Now, that was only possible because of this procedural rule and because of the fact that we could organize things in a very systemic fashion. What we also did there was to, in essence, uh, look very carefully, together with the IMF, incidentally, which was advising us uh, at that stage, at the effects these plans had on lending to the real economy. So we, we did an explicit test to ensure that there wasn't an undue uh, reduction in lending to SMEs and households, whilst, of course, the total lending capacity of these groups was significantly diminished because most of them had been uh, active uh, on a very large scale uh, in terms of channeling funds to real estate developers. That fell away, and if you look at the aggregate figures, that, of course, leads to a situation where total lending by these banks dropped a lot. But if you look at the composition of the lending, then you'll see that uh, the lending to SMEs and households actually was, was maintained. So we could, we could plan and program that by, by working uh, in this more uh, systemic uh, fashion. Second feature that was very important, and I've already referred to it, is the burden sharing. Now, what you see here uh, are essentially three groups of banks. I have a beamer, I think. Uh, let me see. Um, I'm not 100% sure how this works. So three groups of banks. The top line gives you the um, capital needs that flowed from the AQR and the stress tests. Uh, group one was by far the biggest group, the group in which you, you had banks like Bankia, uh, 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 NCG, Caixa uh, uh, Catalunya, so, so big banks uh, with big capital holes. Group two banks and group three banks were much smaller, had much smaller capital needs, I should say. But the total hole was about 55.9 billion euros. And uh, in essence, what we managed to do on the back of these new rules, uh, rules was to require conversion uh, and asset sales, as well as, frankly, private sector uh, capital raises. And this was very important because in group three, where you had the stronger banks that nevertheless were in trouble, uh, these banks actually managed to go to the market uh, in extremely uh, depressed circumstances and raise capital. So okay, sh shareholders were heavily diluted as a result, but these banks didn't require state aid. And that was part of uh, the design of the program. In other cases, uh, as you can see in the bottom line, uh, the forced conversion of uh, junior debt through uh, LMEs, first voluntary, then uh, forced, uh, led to uh, a lot of capital being created, a lot of equity being created through uh, the conversion of junior debt. And that saved uh, about slightly uh, south of 13 billion euros in terms of the capital injection. So all in all, all these different features of our burden sharing rules led to a reduction in uh, the bill for the taxpayer of about 23%. Now, that was very significant. It was very controversial at the time. There was a significant worry on the part of many bankers in the country that by acting in respect of junior debt holders, we would destabilize uh, deposits. Um, another concern was that many of these junior debt holders were uh, the best clients of the banks and that they would walk away. Um, there was a significant concern that some of these junior debt holders had bought instruments they hadn't understood um, and that maybe the bank shouldn't have been selling them to retailers to begin with, which led to uh, quite a lot of uh, legal action outside of the context of our rules, obviously. But all in all, I think it's fair to say that uh, the operation was, was rather successful. We completed uh, these restructuring plans in record time. We saved uh, a lot of money for the Spanish taxpayer. Um, and uh, these banks uh, are now, uh, you know, nearly a year after the adoption of their restructuring plans, all uh, on schedule. The, most of these banks actually are doing slightly better than the requirements set out in, uh, in these restructuring plans. So that was a very important moment in uh, the way we um, have dealt with uh, uh, banks in, uh, in, in Europe under state control. And many of the lessons learned in Spain were, were then subsequently introduced in our uh, banking communication in the new rule book, which uh, was adopted in July. I think the fact that we had to rewrite the rules was motivated by the fact that diverging bailwin requirements, Cyprus, Spain versus the rest, you know, was essentially leading to a situation where market participants had a very different perception of the riskiness of banks. You know, if you're a strong bank in a weak sovereign and for some reason you get into trouble, then, you know, you're going to be hit by these tough burden sharing rules. If you're a weak bank in a strong sovereign, then you know, they, they, the market participants thought you would only be required to comply with uh, the then existing state aid rules, which were uh, not so requiring, not so demanding, I should say. So that led to, I think, uh, differences in uh, 
uh, funding costs for banks with, with very similar credit qualities, which in terms of the function of the internal market uh, was extremely uh, serious and we, we had to act uh, on it. Second element, uh, I'll come to that in the last part of my presentation, of course the whole discussion about the SSM, the SRM Banking Union, uh, uh, very important, but you know, applying only to the Eurozone, stated rules apply to all 28, we have to keep the internal market together. Um, it's also clear that phasing in SSM, SRM Banking Union will require a long transitional period where the European economy is still very vulnerable, where banks are still weak, uh, where accidents can happen, so we needed to put in place transitional rules um, all of which meant that state aid control uh, would uh, remain uh, necessary. Now, I've already alluded to these new banking rules and mentioned some of the key uh, uh, features of these rules, the key innovations, if you will. I'll just very quickly uh, recap them. So the first point is no public recapitalizations or impaired asset uh, measures without uh, a restructuring plan. Um, liquidity support, if necessary, can still be allowed. And enhanced burden sharing uh, requiring, in essence, first banks to go to the market, to raise capital, sell off assets where possible, divest subsidiaries, what have you. Then, uh, subsequently, uh, uh, junior uh, creditors and shareholders will be uh, effective. They will uh, affected. They will have to make a full contribution. But importantly, uh, we stipulated that after uh, the experiences in Cyprus, under state aid rules, senior creditors and deposit depositors will not be, I repeat, not be obliged to contribute. We, we felt that that clearly would be a bridge uh, too far at, that, uh, at, this, at this juncture in the, in the evolution of the crisis. So our rules put the balance, uh, put the line, if you will, at the level of the junior creditors. Um, and once you do all of that, then you, know, you can actually resort to, to state aid and the normal rules kick in. Now let me I see the slide has disappeared for some reason. So let me just say that we have done some empirical work to assess the importance uh, of uh, these burden sharing rules. And in essence, to put it in very simple terms, if in the future a bank needs the medium, median, median uh, uh, capital injection that occurred during the crisis, then for the average bank in the future, uh, the conversion would suffice to deal with the capital hold. So this, these rules could very significantly uh, reduce uh, uh, the need for state aid in the future. Obviously, I should underline uh, in cases where uh, uh, very significant capital holes are discovered, then uh, uh, you know, there will still be a need for uh, significant uh, state aid, but for medium-sized uh, uh, capital uh, uh, shortfalls, these rules should go a long way to uh, dealing with the problem. So how does, this, how does all of this fit in, in the transition uh, to the banking union and in the steady state? Well, just to very quickly recall uh, why uh, you know, this uh, uh, initiative was taken, in essence, to break the link between the sovereigns and the banks to ensure that uh, we would have a mechanism for uh, the euro area where banks would be supranational, their uh, supervision would be supranational and also in death, uh, they would be dealt with uh, 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 centrally to avoid uh, a uh, uh, identity between the problems of the sovereign and the problems of the banks and vice versa. So that was very important. Um, now, I would also say that underlying this, the confidence effect of a banking union uh, has widely been seen as crucial to uh, economic uh, recovery. Uh, because with, impaired, with an impaired banking system, no economy can, can actually grow. So uh, uh, this was, uh, and still is, uh, I think a central challenge to, to put Europe on a sustainable growth path. I think the three most important features, not all of the features of uh, the banking union, are the single supervisory mechanism, the SSM, a resolution me mechanism, the SRM, and, and funding arrangements for, for, for resolution, the single resolution fund which uh, are now all in discussion and negotiation against the background of a single rule book for all member states, the EU28, which uh, is of course formed by the Commission's proposal on the BRRD, the Bank uh, Restructuring and Resolution Directive, which sets rules applying to all 28 member states. And this little red uh, uh, thunderbolt, uh, I think, points to the risks that you may have if you have very different uh, 
uh, applications uh, uh, between the uh, Euro between the banking union ins and the banking union outs, and, and of course this is where state aid control, which applies to all member states, uh, comes in. So thinking about transition, um, I think it's worth looking at uh, four lines. I mean, the legal framework uh, is one line. The work on the fund is another line. Our state aid rules uh, as, as, a, as a transitional facility uh, are a third. And then finally, the role of the ESM. Very briefly, the, looking at the legal framework, the SSM uh, you know, has now been uh, adopted. We'll enter into force uh, a year from now. Um, and that, of course, for the banking union, provides for supervision uh, the uh, central uh, uh, framework, uh, essentially uh, putting this at a supranational level for, for the 130 biggest banks in the union, representing uh, uh, more than 80% of euro area plus uh, banks. At the same time, uh, discussions on the BRD and the translation of BRD principles, which is the SRM for the euro zone plus countries are still ongoing. Uh, it is very much hoped, uh, and uh, indeed it's the firm intention of the co-legislator to finalize discussions before uh, this parliament, uh, uh, European parliament, uh, stops activities uh, in its present uh, format in, in April of this year. Um, but if the proposals as they stand are adopted, uh, then uh, bail-in would kick in under the new rules, the BRD rules, which foresee the a foresee a contribution from a senior creditors, they would kick in uh, only in 2018, and the new state aid rules would, would, would form a, a bridging solution. The single resolution fund, as per the proposals, is built up slowly through contributions from the industry, uh, which means that uh, over time the likelihood that state resources are needed uh, will decrease, but this will take time, and there is an issue of uh, ensuring that there is liquidity available for the fund in the meantime. State aid rules I've just explained. Um, we will need to look again at the state aid rules when all the regulatory building blocks are, are in place. Um, let me just say that um, to the extent that the ESM, the last line, intervenes in this process, state aid rules will still uh, need to be applied because the ESM, being an intergovernmental body, Funding from the ESM, I mean, is, is uh, subject to state aid control. And finally, the state aid rules will be applied by analogy. I'll come back to that in, in, uh, in a minute. Uh, will be applied by analogy for interventions by the uh, SRM. Now, uh, I'm not going to give you all of the detail of where the BRRD rules stand. This is the Council's position, the general approach taken in the Council. Let me just zoom in on two important points here. One is that the trigger for resolution whether a bank goes into resolution or, or, or not into resolution, um, is not as strict as the Commission had initially proposed. The Commission had proposed that any state aid would lead to resolution, but you know, the final position is that uh, a bank should be failing or likely to fail, and this, of course, is something which the supervisor would need to decide. What's important is that if you take a proxy to look at what failing or likely to fail actually means. And if, if this proxy were to be insolvency, then looking at the 67 cases we've dealt with to date, in more than two-thirds of the cases, a bank would not have gone into resolution. So state aid would still be possible. So it's a significant change that has occurred in, uh, in the discussions. Secondly, there is the famous waterfall in terms of the use of the bail-in tool uh, with a lot of uh, bail-in required, 8% of eligible liabilities before some public funds can enter into a resolution uh, scenario. Um, so the, burden, the, the uh, uh, bar has, has been set, uh, set, set, set quite, quite high. Uh, but you know, once you hit that bar, there is uh, the possibility for uh, uh, public funds entering uh, into the equation to pay for the legacy costs that are associated with the resolution. And all of this means that, although it's hard to read, um, that there is some flexibility left uh, in this and that therefore the possibility of state aid being granted also in a resolution context is significant and as I've said, maybe we will actually see fewer resolutions than uh, uh, some uh, uh, colleagues uh, think in terms of uh, what the triggers in the new BRD approach actually mean. That's basically what I've said here. Now, the SRM proposal, this would be the translation of the BRD principles into a body 
dealing with resolution at the level of uh, the euro area as a whole. The Commission has proposed that uh, it would apply to all banks covered in supervisory terms by the SSM. Um, under the existing treaty, it is clear that only an institution, an EU institution, can, 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 can exercise the discretion that is inherent in, in, in any resolution, and therefore the Commission has proposed, after a long reflection, and simply because we couldn't find uh, a better institution, if you will, uh, that the Commission should take on this role, uh, but it would, in effect, uh, uh, take this role uh, in institutional terms whilst ensuring that the actual work is done by a board which is comprised of members uh, from member states, the ECB and ourselves, which would do all the hard work, the resolution planning, uh, making recommendations on the resolution framework, uh, doing the monitoring, uh, taking ex ante uh, measures. So the board would then eventually, in the case of a specific resolution, uh, make a proposal which the commission would then, uh, as the uh, institution responsible for resolution, decide on. We've also proposed, as I've said, a resolution fund which should build up to a target size of about 60 billion euros based on uh, contributions from the sector. Um, and uh, in our proposal, we've made it very clear, clear that state aid rules uh, would apply in the transition as long as there is state aid. And as you can see, the transition can take, take a while. Um, and at the same time that if uh, the board takes uh, uh, um, resolution decisions not involving uh, state resources, so not involving state aid, it would still have to apply state aid rules by analogy for the very simple reason that otherwise banks in the euro area plus zone would be treated differently than banks outside the euro area plus zone, which of course continue to be um, uh, uh, subject to state aid uh, control. So this is simply a schematic overview of how the SRM would, would look like with this link to the commission, uh, the single resolution fund providing um, uh, support, uh, financial support, uh, and the role, of course, of the ECB as the bank supervisor with the national resolution authorities working for uh, the uh, resolution uh, uh, board. As I've said, we've already looked a bit at uh, the interaction with state aid control in the previous slides, but just to recap, um, as long as the SRM doesn't cover the whole of Europe, you know, basically we, we would need to ensure consistency with state aid control and therefore uh, it would be subject to the same uh, approaches. Um, the application of an by analogy of state aid rules uh, uh, is actually quite aligned with the purposes of resolution. In, in a resolution, you, you try to, to ensure a contribution to financial stability. That's the overriding uh, concern. You minimize the costs of the bank failure uh, for the public. So I, I think the uh, presumed uh, uh, tension between uh, the role of the commission as stated controller on the one hand and the role of the commission as resolution authority as we have proposed it, this presumed uh, conflict of interest actually I think in practice doesn't really exist. It's a point of discussion uh, at the moment. And obviously it also, as I said, uh, helps us in uh, leveraging the knowledge we have obtained to date of dealing with all these, uh, these cases. I think I'd stop there um, and I look forward uh, to our discussion. Thank you very much.